Hello everyone and welcome to our first video in this course on basic psychological processes. I'm your instructor, Dr. Kimberly Campbell, and in this video I'm going to cover a bunch of useful information about this course, who I am, and what you can expect for the upcoming term. So let's start off with an introduction because you're going to be listening to me talk for the next couple of months. So who am I and why should you be listening to me teach you about these psychological topics? So as I mentioned, I'm Dr. Kimberly Campbell. You can call me Kimberly. You can call me Dr. Campbell. Both are perfectly acceptable. Um, when I give an academic background like this, I always try and preface it with the reason why I'm doing it. And that's because as an educator, I'm trying to teach how to critically evaluate information. Where is a claim coming from? Is that individual an expert in that field? So when information is coming to you, you think about where it's from and how much you trust it. So this is me giving you my background so that you know my experience, what I have expertise in, and so that maybe you uh, understand that I am a credible source to be teaching you what's coming out of our textbook. So to begin with, I got my Bachelor of Science at Dalhousie University. And interestingly, for a psychology instructor at least, I didn't start in psychology. I technically started in their physics program, but I very quickly learned that numbers were not my forte and I switched into biology. So I did a five-year undergrad degree in biology, and I stuck around for a while doing research. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what I did as an undergraduate researcher, but it was mostly related to genetics and sequencing, looking at single-celled organisms. Super thrilling stuff. After that, I actually took some time off. I worked for the federal government for a little while in Nova Scotia, and then I decided that I wanted to go back to school. And this is where I had my major career shift. So I went from working on the biology and ecology side of things to going and getting my master's and PhD in psychology, specifically looking at learning and communication in songbirds, which again, I'll give you a little more detail on as we get through this lecture too. Um, but I kind of include that little bit of color because it, helps you guys see that it isn't necessarily going to be a straight course um, from where you start to where you end in your academic career. So sometimes it helps to know that not all of us have a nice clean career path. I've also started to include a little bit more information about me as a person because it's really easy to come across as just a faceless academic voice speaking at you through these videos. So a little bit about me is I'm an avid bird lover. I research birds. I have birds at home. In fact, uh, I have two in the picture here, but I recently just adopted a third. So I have quite a few Conyers at home and you might hear them in the background in some of these videos because they're a little bit uh, vocal is what we'll say. Hopefully my filters do a good job with them, but if you do hear a couple of squeaks here and there, that's what's going on. Um, more about me as a person, I absolutely love chocolate. I do photography in my free time and I have played Pokemon since I was very, very young and continue to do so. Um, in that ever-elusive free time I mentioned, I like to collect hobbies. So things like sewing, knitting, crochet, sculpture, painting. I like to try all of those things. I'm not necessarily great at all of them, but it's something to do. So that's just a little bit of me as a person. And actually, while I'm talking about uh, birds that you might hear, just another cute close-up picture. Um, this isn't just an excuse to show more cute bird pictures, but it does serve a purpose to talk about um, the, the background noise that you might hear. Um, and if, we, if you end up coming to any of our live uh, meetings, then you might see these guys. So just giving people a heads up in case you're not the biggest fan of birds. All right, so more about my credentials. This is going to be more about my research background as opposed to talking about my academic background, though there is quite a bit of overlap here. So as I mentioned, for an, uh, as an undergraduate in the bio program at Dalhousie, I was doing research in a lab that was looking at single-celled um, microorganisms. So I would go out and collect soil samples and extract the DNA of any microorganisms in that soil, and then I would design an experiment 
or I would design PCR primers to pull out genes so that we could sequence those genes and see what species we had. Um, so I have quite a background on PCR and cloning and running gels and stuff like that, which isn't necessarily useful in my day-to-day -day life in psychology, but it is kind of helpful, especially if we start talking about things related to biology. For my graduate research, as I said, I took a pretty big step sideways and started studying something completely different. So I've looked at learning and communication in black cap chickadees. And I actually like to do a small sub-lecture when we get into the chapter on learning. And I talk about using operant conditioning, which is a type of learning technique, um, in black cap chickadees. So I'll give you a little bit more information about what I do then. But for the basics of it, um, we'll play sounds to black cap chickadees, teach them that some sounds are good and get them food, and some sounds don't get them food. And then we'll play them new sounds and see if they treat them the same as the sounds that get them food, or if they treat them like the no food sounds. And by looking at how they react, we can figure out if these birds are putting sounds in the same category or not, which is a pretty cool way of understanding how their minds are interpreting information. But as I said, I'll give you more details on that when we actually learn about operant conditioning, because the setup makes a lot more sense with that background. And my last point for introducing myself as your instructor is to talk a little bit about my teaching philosophy. I always like to point out the fact that my slides are very boring, you might say. Um, plain, black text on a white background. Um, you'll find that a lot of my images are fairly high contrast, and that's actually an intentional choice. I've had some students who have visual difficulties, and textbook uh, slides and figures from textbooks tend to be notoriously bad with contrast, so they're very hard for some students to see. And so I've gone out of my way to try and fix that, to make it accessible so everybody can see it. Um, and on that note, if you think of any changes that I can make that would help make this easier to view, or if you think I should talk about something in class, never hesitate to uh, let me know about that. I am always looking for a way to improve my content. Um, more about my teaching philosophy. I always point out that online learning is very new and different. Some of us have been doing this for almost two years now, but maybe some people this is their first online course. So there's a little bit of a learning curve here. And I try and introduce as much flexibility as possible into my courses so that students have that chance to get used to what's going on, how things are done, and when things are due before the term gets too far away from. So you'll find that there's a lot of flexibility coming up as we talk about things being due and when they're due and um, that sort of thing. So um, I expect that there will be a learning curve, but so should you. So if, you know, I experience technical difficulties, that might happen. I might have to re-record a lecture here or there if something goes wrong. But for the most part, I would hope that I have it figured out by now. Um, my last point here is that I'd like you guys to try and make use of the resources that are available. So I have weekly office hours. I will meet with you guys. I'll show you the, the dates on how to access that when we get over onto our eClass site. But I'll do live Zoom meetings twice a week so that we can sit down and talk face to face. If you have any questions, we can chat about it that way. If you just want to interact with other people in the class, you can do that there too. It's a really nice way that we stay connected, even though this is an online course. I also like to include lots of videos and extra links, whether that be in the slides that I'm teaching from, or if it's on our eClass site itself. Um, I don't include these videos and extra links because I test directly from them or anything like that. I just like giving you another perspective on what we're learning. I do find that sometimes people might not quite click with the way that I explain a topic, but maybe I find a great YouTube tutorial that talks about the topic a little bit differently, and maybe that works for other people. So I like to give you as many different options as I can because I find it helps to have that information presented as many ways as possible. So if you find you're struggling with a topic, maybe check and see what extra resources I've given you, and maybe some of those will help. And if all else fails, don't be afraid to reach out to either myself or RTAs. 
You can make use of our general forum if you want to post a question that you think might be relevant to everyone in the class. But we're here to help you out. We're going to try and answer your questions as best we can. So don't don't leave things too, too long because it's very easy to get overwhelmed with stuff not making sense. So if you have questions, ask. All right. So next is actually going to be the first of what are many tangents that I uh, tend to go off on. And this is going to just be um, something that I find interesting and useful, but isn't actually relevant for the class. It's not something you're going to be tested on. I just found that as an undergraduate, I was never told how I should interact with other people in academia. And I found it very intimidating to try and reach out to people because they seem to have a set of rules that I didn't know about. So as soon as I started teaching, I decided that I would share those sort of hidden rules because it makes it a lot easier to reach out to people and to not feel as intimidated. So I'm just going to do a brief sidestep here and we can talk about how do you address people in academia? So if you're sending someone an email or if you're meeting someone in person, you might wonder what title to use. Do you call them instructor, doctor, or professor? And the answer is that it's going to depend on the individual and on their background. So I'm going to tell you the rules of which ones are acceptable when. So if we start with doctor, doctor is going to be somebody who has a PhD or an MD. Um, I mostly interact with other PhDs, so that's what I use. Um, but MDs would also fall under the category of doctor. So as I mentioned, I have a PhD, which means that you can call me Dr. Campbell. That would be an official title that works. If somebody is a professor, that someone, almost always a doctor, has the specific job title of professor. So they were hired as a professor and their job title is professor, usually of arts or science, if you're uh, in the psychology department. Um, this might be a little bit different overseas. Um, I know that professor might be more preferred, I believe, in England, but I'm not too sure of that. I'm only really familiar with North America, but professor would be the job title here. Um, for instructor, instructor is kind of a generic term for someone who isn't a professor, but is teaching a course. So I'm teaching this course, but my job title isn't professor. I'm actually an assistant lecturer, so you could call me instructor and that would also be okay. And I have a visual for those of you who enjoy visual interpretations. Um, so here we have this tiny little pink dot in the middle. That's me. As I said, I could be called doctor because that's my um, title that I have for my degree. But my job title, you could call me instructor. Um, I do not fall under the professor category because that isn't my job. And so if we wanted to use a different example, I always use my graduate supervisor because I can pull up his information really quickly. So we can look at Christopher Sturdy and we have his uh, listed degrees. So he has a Bachelor of Arts, Master of Arts and a PhD. So because he has a PhD, we would be very confident calling him Dr. Sturdy. That would work with his titles. We can also notice that his job title is listed as a professor of science. So we could also call him Professor Sturdy and be fairly comfortable with that as well. I do like to add in the caveat here that these rules of addressing people is a good way to start. So in your first email, um, maybe you'll send something to me and you'll say, hey, Dr. Campbell, I have a question. Um, and then you sign off with however you want to be addressed. And then in my response, you can actually check my sign off. And my habit is, if you've addressed me as Dr. Campbell, my sign-off will be just my first name. And that's me giving you a subtle cue that I'm okay with you just using my first name. You could continue with Dr. Campbell if that's what you're comfortable with, but by using my sign-off, that's sort of a subtle nod to what I'm comfortable with you calling me. So, and that works outside of academia, I find as well. If somebody sends you an email, you look at their signature, what they've signed off as, and that's a great way to respond to them. So if they use their first name, then you're probably pretty safe responding with their first name in your follow-up. 
Um, and that's just pretty useful to have because sometimes I would get anxious about how to ask or how to communicate with people, how to respond to people and that sort of thing. And that was a neat little rule that I figured out probably a lot later in my academic career than I should have. So I'm passing that knowledge along to you so that you don't have to worry about that the way that I did. All right, so our next portion is to actually get into the content of this course. So I wanna introduce you to what's gonna be happening in this class. For those of you who may have already taken a course at the U of A, this may be old information, stuff that you're used to, but for those who haven't taken a course online or at the U of A at all before, I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail just so that you have that information so you know where to start in this class. So we're going to start with E-Class, and E-Class is going to be the main source of information for this course. That's going to be where you found this video. That's going to be where you can find slides. That's where the syllabus is posted, announcements. Um, I'm even going to include frequently asked questions and the general forum where you can post your own questions and get responses. You'll also have resources for all of our course assessments. So that's where you can get access to our uh, written assignment information when we get to that. That's also where you're going to access your midterms and final exam. Um, I'm going to post all of my lecture videos and slides on eClass as well. So you'll have access to those in time to watch them during the class that we'd normally cover them in. Um, and on that note about lectures, we're going with an asynchronous delivery method. I find that a lot of students have schedules that they're trying to work around. And so by pre-recording my lectures and making them available to you to watch at your leisure, that way you're not stuck to just during the class period. So the lectures are pre-recorded. I'm gonna post them on YouTube and put a link on eClass so that you can click on our eClass page and it'll take you right to the video that you need. Um, the joys of using YouTube is that you have the option to play the videos at either faster speed or slower speed. You can bring up uh, subtitles. You can sort of pause it and come back to it. All those sort of things that you get from a normal YouTube video, you then get from the lectures, which is pretty great. Um, I'm also going to be posting the slides on eClass as both PowerPoint and PDF files. If you need a different type of file format, just let me know. But for the most part, those two seem to be pretty ubiquitous. Um, and I try and post the slides a little bit early, so you'll have access to the slides before I start recording. Um, and then that way you just have a little bit of advanced uh, warning with the slides. But everything will be posted in time to cover it during that week. And if I'm done either the slides or the lectures early, I'll always post them early. I'll just put them in the week folder for when we would be covering them. Um, but sometimes I do get a little bit ahead with my lecture recordings, and I don't think it's a bad thing for you to have access to them early. So I'll just post them where they're supposed to be. And then if you wanted to glance ahead, you might see some future content if you wanted to do that. I also hinted at the fact that we have some live meetings during the week. So on Mondays at 11.30 a.m. and on Tuesdays at 2.30 p.m., both in Edmonton time or MST, I'm holding optional Zoom meetings. So these aren't mandatory, I'm not taking attendance or anything like that. But what I am going to be doing is having a sit down and if you have questions or just want to hear what questions other students have, you can come into the Zoom meeting, ask your questions, we can discuss to course topics or even just chat about science in general. I find that with these meetings, if people don't have a ton of course related questions, maybe we'll talk about grad school or undergrad courses or whatever we find interesting. And the way that I set these up is that there's a link on eClass and it'll be under the live meeting section. You can just click in and enter into the meeting for that day. And I said, uh, attendance is not mandatory. I'm not taking attendance. You don't have to be there. Some students just find it useful and it's nice to have a little bit of interaction. And the way that I schedule these meetings is that I will stick around for at least 15 minutes. And after 15 minutes, if everybody's out of questions, if we're all just sitting there staring at each other in silence, then we can call it a day. I'll end the meeting at the 15 minute mark. 
However, if we're still having a really good discussion, if we're still having lots of questions and we're talking about things, I'll stick around for up to an hour or more, depending on my schedule. So I've had these meetings go anywhere from exactly 15 minutes up to, I think I had one almost an hour and a half because we started talking about grad school and things to look for and a supervisor and all sorts of cool stuff. So these are very informal, very flexible. Um, and if you can't make either of these meetings, but you'd still like to chat with me sort of face to face on Zoom, just send me an email and I'll set up a private meeting so that we can meet in Zoom at a time that works for both of us. For the last part of this video, I just wanna take some time and go through our e-class go through our textbook, as well as highlight some of the points in our syllabus, just so that you know where all of this information is and you know what to expect coming into this course and where to find things. So I'm gonna start here on our e-class page. As I said, you've probably found this page by yourselves, but uh, this is what our e-class should look like to you. At the top, we have our general course information, including a link that'll take you to my email. So if you click on this, it'll pop up a new window with my email address in it. Um, and I also ask that you include the, uh, uh, the course code, our Psycho 104, in the subject line of your emails. And that just helps me tell the difference between different classes. Because some questions that you ask, the answer will depend on which of my classes you're in. So I wouldn't want to give you, say, more or less information than you needed um, by just generally answering a question. So let me know what class you're from, and it'll get you a better response. For office hours, like I said, we're doing those live weekly Zoom meetings, but I will also set up one-on-one, -on -one, or even if you have a couple of people who want to see me at the same time, we can set up meetings that work for our schedules. Just send me an email that includes your availability, and we can set something up. In this course, we have three different teaching assistants. Um, if you need to, you can contact any of the three teaching assistants. Um, so we have Aika, Katie, and Pratik. Their emails are here as well. And the same thing, if you're going to email them, please also include the course code so they know where you're coming from. If we continue down, this is where you get access to our course syllabus. And I'll show you guys that in just a minute because that is one of the most important documents for this class and it's going to be an important document for all of your classes. So we'll go over that briefly as well. We have announcements here on our eClass page. I would recommend checking the announcements every once in a while, but the way that the announcements work is that you should automatically receive an email to your U of A email address um, every time I post an announcement to the course. So if you're enrolled in the course, you will have that email to you directly. But it is sometimes nice to be able to click in and see all of the announcements in one place. I typically use announcements to remind you of an upcoming due date or to let you know if something is changing or if something has to be moved or anything like that. Um, so mostly that's going to be, hey, don't forget that there's a midterm coming up or congratulations on finishing the midterm. Here's when you can expect the grades. So the announcements are usually stuff like that. We also have a general forum. So this is what I was referring to when I said you can post your questions on our forum. If you would like, you can actually subscribe to the general forum so that you see when other students post to the forum. So then it's not just your own posts and your own responses that you see, but you can have notifications to your email every time there's a post. And I find that helps with a lot of questions if um, maybe a bunch of people have the same question. Having it posted in the forum means that you can see what other people have already asked and what the answer is for that. Um, I also have here just a quick link to our Top Hat site. So that's the site that our textbook goes through. And I'll show you that as well in just a moment. And then at the bottom here, we have all of our collapsed topics for this course. So these are all expandable. So you can click open and closed. Um, this one here, getting started in the course, is actually going to be where this video is linked. Um, so that will not be empty when you get there. But um, I also have our live meeting information. So there's an online etiquette guide, which is basically telling you to be nice and respectful and um, no profanity and be patient because there might be a bunch of you attending these meetings. 
Um, this is also where you can click in to go to the Zoom meetings. So that's the link that you'll click on if you decide you want to come to one of our Zoom meetings. I've also uh, included the email policy that I have. So if anything is personal, I encourage you to email me directly, or if it's something relevant to our TAs, you can email them directly. For general information, if it's a question that you think somebody else might want to know the answer, then it's a lot better to post it in the general forum, um, and then that way we can respond to it there. And for the general forum, um, the TAs and myself will have subscribed to that, so we'll get notifications when um, posts are made there. But if you know the answer to a question, you are more than welcome to answer questions there as well. It's meant to be a very informal way for us to pose and answer questions. So more useful information, we have our textbook information here. So these are the links that you can click to get to our Top Hat site. Um, this is also our course code if you need to sign up and register for our specific course. So there's lots of links here and it also gives you um, information if you're having problems. So if it's not working, if you're getting an error message, it includes, uh, I think there's a phone number, help link, emails that you can send, all of those things are there. Um, and then the rest of it is stuff that is going to be populated as the semester goes on. So things like practice examinations. As we get closer to our midterms and to the final exam, I'll post a couple of practice questions and I'll set up an environment that will behave similar to an exam so that you see how it works. Um, and then you'll also have our exam stuff here. Um, so this is, I don't think it's visible to you guys. Oh no, it is visible to you guys. Okay. Um, so this is just the basics of our midterm. You can't get into it right now, but it gives you the description of it. And I'll cover that when we go into our uh, syllabus. Um, the probably one of the most important tabs for you guys to look at right now is the research participation tab. And so in intro psychology, we don't have a lab component the way that a traditional science course would. So it's not like a bio lab where you go to a room and conduct experiments and write up reports. Instead, that lab component for Psych 104 is actually called research participation. And it's where you sign up and complete different research projects. So you get to be a participant in psychological research. So I would encourage you to read through all of this information and there are some videos and hand, handouts here that explain how that research participation program works. That is all run by our research coordinator, Dr. Lynch or Carleen. Um, so she's the one who has all the information about research participation. So if after reading this over, you still have a couple of questions, she's going to be your best resource to ask, um, just because us instructors don't really get involved in that research participation. In fact, I don't even have access to the system, so I'm not quite sure how it works. But um, she is our expert and she's very, very nice to talk to. So I recommend reaching out to her after you've gone through all of the resources here. And then at the bottom here, we get into our class stuff. So I've already posted the slides for chapter one, the stuff that we're going to be covering later on this week and into next week. Next, I want to briefly go over our syllabus for this class. If you have read a syllabus before, then you're probably familiar with a lot of this information. If you haven't actually read all the way through a syllabus before, I recommend that you do it at least once. And that's because the syllabus has lots and lots of useful information, including links, um, what to do in case of different situations, who to contact, different resources, all sorts of useful things. So I'm going to hit the high points here because this is an eight page document and it can take a while to get through, but I am just going to point out what I think is important. And then I encourage you to read this over from the beginning to end um, when you have a chance. So most of this information at the top is stuff that you already saw on E-Class, and that's because it's the same information just repeated again. I include that uh, the lectures are being pre-recorded and they're going to be posted on E-Class. That's perfect. The live meetings information that we've already discussed is here as well. And then um, for all of our evaluations, so our tests, assignments, and everything are going to be completed online. We're going to go through each of those one at a time as we go through this document. 
All right. So for most of this stuff, this is sort of what kind of resources you need for remote learning, our course objectives, the textbook. These are the links that I had provided on eClass as well. And our next uh, sort of scene hop will be to actually show you that Top Hat site so that you get a feel for it. But we'll keep scrolling because I already pointed out where that is somewhere else. And this is the exact same information. All right. So the first of the really important pieces of information for this class is this table here. For most of my classes, what I do is I print out this page of my syllabus and I tape this to my wall so that I can track all of our dates and our topics and everything that we need to know. So it might be a great idea for you to do something similar. At the very least, it's a good idea to make note of our important dates. Things like the fact that next Monday is Labor Day, so there's no classes. Or that September 27th is our first midterm. It also notes that our first midterm covers chapters 1, 2, and 3. So this information is here for you to access. A great thing to do at the beginning of the semester is to take these important dates and put them into either a physical or digital calendar so that you have a reminder as the semester goes on. Um, this is also going to let you know what topics we cover each week, and this is a tentative guide. Sometimes topics go a little bit faster, sometimes a little bit slower, but for the most part, this is about how we're going to divide things up. All right, so next we can talk about all of our different assessments. And because this is an online course, I'm doing my best to sort of spread out where you're getting your marks from. I'd like you to have as many different opportunities to get grades so that maybe if you're not the best at, say, writing tests, there are other places that you can get marks. So we have our two midterms, which are here at the top. They're worth 20% each. No, uh, September 27th and November 1st are those midterm dates. The midterms are not cumulative, which means that that first midterm is going to cover the first three chapters, and the next midterm is going to cover the three chapters that come after that. There's no overlap in topic for the midterms. For our final exam, however, that's when it will be cumulative. It means that while most of the questions on our final exam will be from the last three chapters we cover, if I scroll back up here, we cover chapters 8 and 11 after the second midterm. The majority of our final exam will be drawn from chapters 8 and 11, but I will also ask some questions from the earlier chapters and try and get you to make connections between multiple chapters just to show your understanding of the course topics as a whole. And I'll give you a lot more information about these exams as they get closer. So we'll usually have a video that goes out where we talk about what to expect. For the basic format of the midterms and final, though, I'm going to scroll down here. So our midterms are going to be 50 minutes long. They're going to have multiple choice and short answer questions, and they're going to be written on eClass. So you're going to be able to access it through that uh, section I showed you on eClass, and you're going to write them during our normally scheduled class time, so between 1 and 5 p.m. Edmonton time. These are set up so that you can use your notes, you have access to the textbook, you can use whatever resources you would like during these exams. Um, but just keep in mind that your time will be tight and that a lot of the questions that I ask aren't going to be memorization type questions. I like asking questions that get you to apply information. So if we learn about a concept, could you make that concept apply to a situation in real life? And I'd like to give lots of examples of the types of questions that I ask as I teach these topics. So by the time that first midterm rolls around, you should have an idea of what kinds of questions I like to ask. And the final exam is going to be two hours long, but it's going to be the same basic setup as the midterm. So it's just going to be like a longer midterm. So still multiple choice and short answer questions, still written on eClass and still open book. Just two hours long instead of 50 minutes. Um, and again, all that info will be um, reiterated to you as we get closer to those dates. So those are the midterms and the final exam. We're also going to have a written assignment. And that written assignment isn't due until November 22nd. And I specifically try not to give you too much information about the written assignment early on 
because you guys have enough going on at the beginning of the semester. So I actually introduce the written assignment, um, the first class after our midterm. So after the first midterm, then I'll introduce the written assignment. So once you've figured out how the written or once you've figured out how the midterms work, then we move on to our next step. I have found, however, that if I just tell you that there's a written assignment, don't worry about it. The first thing that students do is worry about it. So I will also tell you that for this written assignment, it's generally going to be something fairly quick. I'll have you read a scientific article and uh, something under two pages of writing where you will tell me something critically thinking about that article. So I'm going to get you to do a little bit of reading the scientific literature and show that you can understand and make some connections about what you've read. That's all that this assignment is meant to be. It's something that shouldn't take you more than a couple of hours, um, and it's going to be worth 10% of your mark. So I'll give you more details on that after that first midterm. So at the very beginning of October, we'll start talking about the written assignment, and that still gives you plenty of time to work on it then. All right. Um, I mentioned research participation a little bit when we were on E-Class, so I'll mention it again here that that's worth 10% of your total grade for this class, and you'll be completing the research um, credits either through the online site that's linked through the stuff on E-Class, or some of the research participation that you can choose to sign up for. Some of it's going to be happening on campus, but it's your choice. You pick what works for your schedule, your comfort levels, your availability, that sort of stuff. So you'll complete those throughout. And again, I recommend just sitting down and watching through all of the information that Carlene has put up on our E-Class because that is a very good explanation of the process. And so the last portion here are, is our homework assignments. And our homework assignments are going to be one per chapter. Um, and there's going to be, so eight total throughout the semester because we cover eight chapters and they're worth 10% total. And so I'll scroll down here so we can talk just a little bit about it. And this will transition us very nicely over to Top Hat in just a second. So our homework assignments are multiple choice questions that are based on your textbook readings and are completed through the Top Hat site that you use to access the textbook. Um, I've set this up so that as we start covering topics, the homework assignments will be made available to you. So for example, right now you have access to the homework assignments for chapters one, two, and three. And that's because those are the three assignments that are going to be covered on that first midterm. And so though I encourage you to do the homework assignments as we move through these topics in lecture, so as we cover chapter one, it might be a good idea to do the chapter one homework. But sometimes that doesn't work. Maybe you have a really busy week. Maybe you want to do all of them all at once. Um, that's entirely up to you. So what I've done is I've opened up those three chapters starting today, and they are open all the way until the midterm that tests those topics. So our first midterm is on September 27th, and so the chapter one, two, and three homework assignments aren't due until midnight or 11.59 p.m. on September 27th. So you can do these all the way up until the day that we have our midterm. I highly recommend you do them earlier, but I do find that sometimes people like to work through these assignments as preparation for the midterm. So it might be nice to work on them as you're studying. So you get to choose when you do them all the way up until 11.59 p.m. At that due date point, they will submit, um, and then that's the end of those assignments. Then we move on to the next batch of assignments. With our talk of these homework assignments, let's actually hop over to our Top Hat site for this course and actually show you what this site looks like so that you know what to expect. Um, for those of you who have already purchased the textbook, you might have found this site already. If you haven't, um, or if you're waiting on funding or anything like that, if you're trying to decide if you're going to purchase the textbook, all of those things, you can come into our Top Hat site by following the links on eClass or in our syllabus, and you can sign up for, I believe it's a 14-day free trial, so you can get a feel for it and if this method of instruction is going to work for you. Um, and then if you decide you're going to buy the textbook, then you can upgrade that way. 
So this is what it looks like at the beginning here. This is just their general welcome page. They explain how the uh, textbook works, how the questions work. They give you some information on the authors of the course. I've also included some of my own information about uh, my background, so a little bit more than what I gave during my introduction here, as well as a table of contents, so it lets you know what's in this textbook. For this course, I've actually taken only about half of the chapters that the textbook covers because we only cover about half of the topics. So we're going to start with our uh, module one, which is our first chapter, and it's talking about what is psychology. And so here, for each of our modules, for each of our chapters, you'll have access to three, no, four different things. Um, on the screen there are five, and that's because I have access to an extra copy of slides that came with the textbook, but I've made my own slides that I like a lot better for this topic. So what you see is the reading assignment, my chapter slides, the homework assignment, and then a glossary for this chapter. And so for each of these, you can click into them and you can look at the textbook here. So it's just like you would have a physical textbook, but the great part about Top Hat is that they have these interactive questions throughout. Um, and you can choose to do these or not, but they're a fantastic way to start using the information as you read. And in here, you can start highlighting information, you can make your own notes, whatever you need to do. Um, You'll also have access to the same slides that I've posted on eClass, so you can have access to them in the same window that you're doing your Top Hat stuff. And then the glossary is also fairly useful because it gives you some of the really important concepts that we talk about in that chapter, um, and they give you the definitions all in one place, which is really nice. But the part that you're probably wondering about is the homework assignments. And so these are just a series of short answer questions. And these are basically weighted partially through participation and partially through getting the correct answer. So um, even if you answered all of the questions wrong, you would still get marks for participating. And so these are out of 30 points, you get about half the points for participating and half the points for getting the answer right while you're participating. Um, so it's meant to be a way to give you sort of a little bit of a boost to give you that chance to look over these questions, choose your answers, um, and, and go that way. And this screen will look a little bit different for you guys. I don't have a way of viewing from a student's perspective, but um, this is what it looks like to me. So you get to see the questions like this, and then you can click through and give your answers. And so this doesn't close until that September 27th at midnight uh, cut off for the assignments. So now that you've actually seen that Top Hat setup, I do want to draw your attention to the fact that Top Hat is sort of a third party. They're setting this up on their site, and that is part of the cost of the textbook. If you do not want to use Top Hat for homework, I can set up an alternative no cost task to get the corresponding grades. It's usually just going to be some kind of writing assignment. Um, we'll, we can discuss that if that's going to be an issue for you. So if you need to opt out of using Top Hat, just make sure that you contact me before the add drop deadline. So that's September 15th. Just give me a heads up by then. That's about when the free trial of Top Hat runs out anyways. So just let me know before that happens and we can uh, talk then. All right, let's see what else we need to cover in our syllabus here. Ah, yes, we should probably talk about what happens if you have to miss a deadline or miss an exam. So I'll start with final exams because final exams are a little bit different. So with final exams, I am not the one that approves or does not approve having to miss a final exam. The university has its own final exam deferral process. So there's a form that you need to fill out and submit to your faculty to request a deferral of a final exam. If that's approved at the admin level, they'll let me know and then we arrange an alternative time that works for your schedule for you to write the final exam if you had to miss it for a legitimate reason. For everything else during the semester, that's going to come to me directly as opposed to through your faculty. So if you have to miss a midterm, 
or if you can't make a deadline for a quiz or not a quiz for a homework assignment, or if you can't submit your written assignment on time, you're going to have to let me know. So the on paper um, approved reasons to miss a deadline is if you have something like uh, incapacitating illness, severe domestic affliction, or some kind of compelling reason. So if you reach out to me and let me know that something has gone on and you can't make a midterm, you can't meet a deadline, um, we will find a way to work around it. For midterms, what I'll do is actually defer the weight of a missed uh, midterm to the final exam. And that's because the final exam is cumulative and tests you on all the content throughout the semester. So um, we just sort of move the weight from the midterm to the final exam. And then that way I don't have to write another midterm and we don't have to find a time that works for all of the students that miss a midterm. Um, so that's the policy there. For pretty much everything else, for all those other deadlines for our assignments, um, those I can adjust the assignment due date for an individual if it's something necessary. For these situations, basically try and let me know as early as you can. If you can give me advanced warning that you're not going to make a deadline, then we can usually come to some kind of agreement or arrangement where we can shift things around. Um, so more notice is better. The hard deadline is that you have to let me know within 24 hours of that missed um, either exam or deadline to have a deferral applied or to have an extension granted. There are some situations where, you know, maybe you couldn't get in touch with me for more than 24 hours because of reasons, um, then I'll always take that into consideration. But I go into more detail about this with our online classes because I find that there's lots going on in people's lives right now. So just so you know what needs to happen if you can't make a deadline, if you have to miss a midterm, um, that's what it is. So just let me know as soon as you can and then we'll find an arrangement. All right, I covered the final exams. I mentioned that our announcements run through eClass. Um, I've included our email policy on eClass. I do also like to encourage students that email me directly. Um, it's a lot more useful if you send me an email, um, if you're asking a question, that also tells me what you already know and what specific part you're struggling with. Generic questions like, I don't understand behaviorism. Those aren't really helpful because that's a pretty large topic and I could write you multiple paragraphs about the topic, but I might not actually hit what you're confused about. But if you send me an email that says, hey, in class, we talked about behaviorism and I understand that it, it is this, but I don't know how to apply it to a new situation. How could we do that? Then I can give you a much more useful email that gets right to the heart of your problem that you're having. So um, consider sending more detailed emails where you tell me what you do and don't understand, and that'll usually lead to a better response um, and probably a faster response as well, because I won't have to write up paragraphs to send it to you. All right, and then for the last part here, we get into things like student responsibilities, um, basically reiterating those guidelines for respectful online engagement, um, talking about academic integrity. This is where we start seeing lots of useful links to university sites and um, documents, um, how exams work, things like that. Um, also a bunch of student resources. So I would recommend that you look through all of these, see which ones apply to you. I would also like to make a point that any students who require accommodations for their exams during this course, please make sure that you sign up for those early. Um, you have to register not only to have um, accommodations, but you also then have to register on Clockworks to have those accommodations apply to each of our examinations. So as soon as you have the dates for our midterms and whenever the final exam date is announced, you're going to want to register for those in advance. I believe you have to register at least a week in advance, but I usually recommend you do it right at the beginning of the semester because that way you don't forget. Um, if you miss that registration cutoff, then um, they usually can't do anything about um, expanding that date. So try and do it as early as possible.
And I believe that is everything I wanted to talk about with our syllabus here. That is a ton of information. So that's going to be it for today. We'll start with our topics. Um, we'll start with chapter one in our next class, but hopefully you're as excited to learn about all of the stuff we're going to talk about this semester as I am to be teaching it all to you. So I'll see you on Friday.